With Halloween right around the corner, it's time for me to pretend I'm an American once more. Celebrating the day of spooks and scares by dressing up as Max Stirner and stealing candy from children 20 years younger than me. But before I do that, let's talk about a classic mainstay of the spooky culture. Vampires. There is something incredible about vampire mythos, mesmerizing and thrilling like a face-to-face -face encounter with the blood-sucking monsters themselves. A simple idea. A humanoid being predating on humans to drink our blood has not only sprung into existence in a lot of cultures across the world seemingly independently, but also managed to twist into tens of different versions while still retaining the same core of the identity. Whether it used force or seduction to fit, looked more or less corpse-like, was an ancient immortal magician or a spirit infecting a fresh corpse, a vampire was a vampire still. And it stayed an interesting concept to this day, liberally used in many works of fiction, or as a metaphor, or as just an aesthetic. From the Slavic Vompiesh, a soul of suicide committer draining blood from their family and neighbors, to the modern broadly western victim of circumstance that is forced to hurt others, starting from those close to them to keep existing. Well, those are two ways to say the exact same thing, but the tone given to each description is different, isn't it? It is no wonder that when White Wolf wanted to make a tabletop role-playing system that focuses on playing as the monsters rather than fighting them, vampires were the first to receive attention, and remained the one setting from the larger World of Darkness that most nerds have a casual recollection of. Not only do the vampire mythos provide a very wide field to play around in, portrayed by the 13 different vampire clans and countless bloodlines spawning from them, but the rapidly developing American nightlife provided a perfect backdrop for the modern take on a world ruled from the shadows by nocturnal fiends. The cool owner of the nightclub where you go every Thursday to do a line of coke and try your luck with some bored 6 out of 10, on a first name basis with the owner of the central bank of your town that was never seen during daylight hours personally. And those room temperature predators are you and your friends, clinging to your last shreds of humanity as the newest generation of pawns in pointless power struggles that reach all the way back to the biblical Cain and Abel. And when I was a teen I thought it sounds really dumb. Not that I gave it a fair shot, as my teenagehood happened at the same time as the Twilight books and movies getting really popular, which I, eternally peer pressurable into forming opinions on things I had no encounter with, also wrote off as something really stupid and not just, you know, not to my specific tastes. Even despite me being a leather jacket wearing, long haired metal concert attending youth that actually bought Nine Inch Nails albums despite his limited allowance and easy access to piracy, I somehow completely ignored Vampire the Masquerade completely. And then I was introduced to the setting by Bloodlines, which, spoiler alert, I consider to be my favorite video game of all time. Not one I talk about the most. Not one I think is flawless, but certainly the one that holds the record of having me replay it seven times over, once for each playable vampire clan. And I got introduced to it by Little Kuribo of Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged fame, doing a let's play and doing voices. It's funny how life works. Sometimes you browse videos and find a link to something that redefines your entire taste in media. Sometimes you take the wrong person home and are reborn as an undead bloodsucker, forever forced to do the bidding of some French bastard named Sebastian. Nobody with that name is good news. But first let's rewind a bit for those who have the misfortune of first hearing about this legendary video game from me. Released in 2004 by Troika Games, the game was the third and final nail to the coffin of this ambitious game studio. Not only was it a Source Engine game contractually obligated to release on the same day as Half-Life 2, it was incredibly buggy on release, which included a particularly nasty game-breaking glitch towards the end of the game for anyone that played a particular clan member. It was, by all accounts, doomed to die forgotten. But, just like a vampire's kiss makes the victim rise from the dead, so was Bloodlines given a new life through the embrace of a modding community that polished out the majority of the bugs and rendered the game stable and playable. Well, for the most part. It is still a shambling corpse and if you look too closely, you might notice how it doesn't breathe at all. But 
why would these mothers not leave this corpse well alone? Because, just like with a vampire, despite your knowledge that there is something wrong underneath all that pretty pale skin, Bloodlines has an incredible allure drawing you closer, just close enough to let it sink its fangs into you and leave a permanent longing for more. And like with all things that make us feel funny feelings, this allure is both instantaneous and layered. From the very first moments of the game, you get instantly hit with the three strengths of Bloodlines, the presentation, the characters and the freedom. The game wastes no time throwing you into a predicament and explaining your situation. One night stand, stake. Public execution turned into political pity points, doing suicide of work for the French. Instantly informing you not only why you have to listen to these people, but also placing you right at the bottom of the vampiric food chain. Only after that is properly explained to you, do you get a chance to walk out of the theater and smell the night air. Los Angeles After Dark is a beautiful, atmospheric place, full of dark corners, synthy ambient music and things that go bonk in the dark. The facial expressions and emoting by the characters especially draws attention. Rather than rigging characters to a generic animation preset, the vampires and mortals of Bloodlines are positively blushing with life, with personalized mannerisms gesticulating and looking around. And speaking of characters, the moment you take a step out into the streets of LA... <laughs> what a scene, man! Hooey! <laughs> then they just plop you out here like a naked baby in the woods. <laughs> How about that? Uh, look, you know, this is probably a lot for you to take in, so uh, why don't you let me show you the ropes? What do you say? You meet Jack, one of the most colorful characters in the entire ensemble cast of the game, a head-busting vampire ex-pirate, set on showing you the ropes of undeath to not just have you thrown into the tooth and nail nocturnal life, and he does it with an incredible charisma. And he was just sitting there smoking during the events in the theater, and the camera made super sure to show you just a bunch of unique character models there just to let you know, hey, Look, there's tons of unique people in here. Will they all turn out to be as interesting as Jack here, making jokes and laughing loudly at every absurdity of vampire mythos and the actions of his kin? One way to find out. And finally, you get the taste of freedom, be it ironically through a linear tutorial that introduces you to a plethora of systems that you can use throughout the game, from combat to supernatural disciplines, or by just throwing you straight into Santa Monica, giving you a small open hub to explore, full of small venues with different ways that you can approach each target. Break into the blood bank, go dancing, mind control a guy to give you his wallet, the world is your oyster, up until you get reminded that you've got shit to do for the French bastard if you don't want your head chopped off for the grand offense of trying not to partake in feudal politics. This threefold first impression is mesmerizing, giving you the looks, the talk and the game. You want to move forward to see more screwed up gothic horror, to talk with more people, to grow your character and explore more and more avenues of how you can interact with the game world. It gives you enough to get you going, whispering sweet promises into your ear and sending you off with a peck on the cheek to show you it means business. There has been a lot of talk about how the first Mario game has the perfect first level, implicitly teaching you all of its mechanics, and while I'm not interested in disputing that, I think it's a bit naive to think the same approach would be universally applicable to all kinds of games. So how do you create an introduction to a narrative-driven play where the majority of the systems are optional? I think Bloodlines is as close to an answer to that question as we ever got. But of course, first impressions can only last so long. Many games banked on being front-loaded, giving you a roller coaster of an experience in the first few hours, only to turn into a treadmill for the remaining 50. But Bloodlines would not be a game I returned to time and time again if it was like that, now would it? So, since we get dragged onto the masquerade ball floor, let's see what is behind that pretty mask. First of all, the game is a role-playing title through and through, and it shows it in all aspects of the game design. 
First, you get to choose your Bloodsuckers clan out of the seven available, which dictates things like where you can initially put your skill points, your unique weakness, like being so pampered you vomit at the thought of drinking the blood of poor people, or being so ugly that you can give an old lady a heart attack just by talking to her, as well as disciplines, supernatural powers that make your clan truly unique. Want to have dialogue options where you look someone in the eye and bend their mind to do something against themselves? Pick a clan that can use Dominate, or a Malkavian, for a truly insane twist on the concept. It's worth noting that your character progression is not hard or soft locked into an archetype. You might start out as a school cracking bruja, but nobody stops you from putting some points into subterfuge to be a good liar on top of that. The skill points only require a set amount of experience to go to a next level, with the costs increasing as you acquire more dots. And experience, unlike in D&D based games or something like Diablo, are not awarded for each enemy you slay, but rather each problem you solve. You gotta get rid of a ghoul that talks too much. Whether you convince her to get out of town, or suck her dry in a dark alleyway after promising her that there is a candy bar lying on the ground there, XP is XP. Which is not to say you can go through the game on a pacifist run and avoid combat completely. If somebody wants you dead, there's no convincing them otherwise. There are a fair number of boss fights in the game and the finale is a big gauntlet of pretty much dungeons, so don't find yourself caught with your pants down with no abilities other than social ones. A lot of people say combat is the worst part of the game. And they're right, but I still like it. It has its issues, Mele has a horrible knockback that breaks all your combos and ranged combat works on Deus Ex aiming mechanics, making guns pretty much worthless until late game and eating up all your money on ammo. But it's fun. It's fun sneaking around for easy insta-kills using obfuscated Nosferatu. It's fun growing close and tearing through enemies as a gangrel. It's fun having 5 dots in celerity as a Toriador and turning the game into the best video game adaptation of the Matrix. It's absurdly fun to just explode people as a 3 mirror blood mage. It's just a shame it takes out of XP investment to get there, and by the time you can fully realize it, you're stuck doing mostly just combat. Which, again, while fun, is the worst part of the entire experience. Especially this goddamn HP sponge of a slug! With the role-playing aspects also come finer mechanical points, like the titular masquerade. Don't make your presence known to humans, silly. You might be a spooky monster, but they outnumber you a thousand to one, and they don't get turned into ash when a ray of sunlight touches their skin. Several quests revolve around this concept, and it even got abstracted into a mechanic. Screw up five times, and it's game over, as you become more trouble than you're worth for the vampiric society at large. It's easy to keep at maximum, I'd dare even say a bit too easy, as having some masquerade violations opens up some fun stuff in the game, like hunters lurking in the shadows for you. There's also humanity, which is a constant struggle in the tabletop RPG, as it's difficult to stay connected with your past mortal life as you hurt people to live and watch your old life grow old and die, which can result in the beast inside you completely taking over and turning you into a ravenous, mindless creature of the night. In Bloodlines, it serves more like a simple morality meter. Full humanity, something that can be endangered by having selfish thoughts in the tabletop, is quite easy to achieve and maintain. It's also impossible for it to drop to zero, as at low levels even the most wanton cruelties do not cause further downfall. But it does give you some deliciously murder hobby dialogue lines whenever people ask you to do things discreetly. What else is there? Oh, yeah, intimidation has its uses, but limited ones compared to other social skills. Often it feels like people tell you to fuck off whenever you try to intimidate them, which, you know, doesn't feel like a good point investment. The Chinatown section is pretty surface level compared to the entire game prior. And while well, there are game mods that add things like additional quests or other playable clans from the tabletop setting, I'm not too warm on them. The game is fully voice acted and hearing one character have two voices always gives me major whiplash. Also on the topic of modding, when installing Wesp 5's restoration mod, which is what gave the game its current immortality and for which I am eternally thankful, 
you have a choice between a basic patch, just bug fixing, and a plus patch, which restores a bunch of cutout content and even adds some. Let me illustrate what I think about the two versions with a picture. We clear? We clear. Okay. As it's probably obvious by now, the body of the game is not without its blemishes, and any attempt to cover them seems to just make them even more prominent. But I do not care, because, let me iterate once more, I love it. I love it in its entirety, and how it changed my outlook on video games and plot elements in them. I love every single character, major or minor. I love the unveiling conspiracy surrounding Sumerian artifacts stolen by the westerners like they can't get better hobbies. I love the in-game radio show. I love how different your dialogue options are when you play Malkavian or Nosferatu. I love every joke it makes, every point of philosophical questioning, every snide remark it makes. I love every questline, from looking for a vampire's lost love to evicting ghosts squatters from an old hotel. Hey, this comes from your deposit, buddy. The game is not of a genre, thematically speaking. It does not try to contrive itself into a given role of being funny or being serious or being scary. It is all of these things, whenever it wants to be, switching from one mask to the next, giving me the closest illusion of life I've ever encountered in video games. Certainly much more convincing than Bethesda's self-replicating fetch quests and randomly generated dialogues. I could get into specifics here, but honestly, why? I don't want to spoil the surprise for you. Go invite Bloodlines for a dance. It's 20 to 30 hours long, and you'll know if you like it within two. It single handedly introduced me to the larger mythos of World of Darkness in all of its imperfect beauty and throwing me in an entire cosmos of really interesting lore and really bad pulp novels. And you have no idea how excited and worried I am at the concept of the sequel and whatever the hell is going on with its development right now. So, with all my heaping praise, do I recommend you buy this game? Well, yes, if you're comfortable giving money to the license holders, that is, Activision, who were the biggest cause of the game's abysmal sales and broken state on release and who are, as of this video's release, accused of gross worker abuse, corruption and sexual harassment by managerial staff. So, how can I give such heaping praise to a game that directly supports real-life bloodsucking monsters? Hey, let me just say, none of us are angels here. And if you don't break the masquerade of our little chat here, neither will I. With those closing words, I finish my letter of infatuation, leaving it in a sealed envelope. And despite, or maybe because of, the fact I poured my soul onto these pages, I hope you never open it. Forever yours, Ashtray Cocktail. Postscriptum. This letter was written thanks to my Patreons, now visible on the screen. If you like hearing me talk about like I want to make out of a piece of software, you might enjoy the rest of my channel. I'm not making any promises about next videos, as I broke the ones made last time with this one. I've got ideas. We'll see if I master the will to bring them to life. Until then. See ya.